I trust you're going to have a really good Monday and a really good week and that you're going to turn a lot of labor hours and crank out a lot of cars this week. I just want to play around here and see if I can talk a little bit about throttle stuff to include some electronic throttle body stuff. This is not going to be a long video, but I do have a couple of things to add to what I've already got on the slides. So let's see if we can get started here. Need a throttle blade? You don't need a throttle blade on a diesel because the fuel is the way that you control the speed and power of the engine. But on a gas burner, because of the fact that it pulls the air on the carburetor, it pulled the air past the Venturi and that drew the fuel out of here and misted it down into the intake manifold. Have to have that throttle plate. When the throttle plate's closed, there's a separate circuit in the carburetor that's giving you your uh, gasoline that it's idling on. But those throttle plates had a Venturi above them in the olden days. Well, that's kind of not the way it is now. But controlling speed with the foot feed, the throttle valve was used to be connected with linkage, the accelerator cable, or you know, they'd have a cable or some linkage, and it would control the amount of air fuel mixture based on where your foot was. Okay, so the throttle valve determines basically engine speed and power, you know, uh, basically, and you're the one that's going to make it, you know, or the cruise control if it's one that's deciding to, you know, apply the throttle and all. Quite interestingly, if you're on hills, you might have noticed that you're using your cruise control, you start going up a hill, the vehicle downshifts. Well, the Mitsubishi folks back in the early days when Jeep and Eagle were part of the same outfit, and some of the vehicles were Mitsubishi made, like Eagle Summit and Talon and all that, <laughs> they would say uh, they had fuzzy logic. And if you had the cruise control set, the transmission computer would not downshift going up a hill the same way it would if you were using your foot. I always thought that was very interesting that they call that fuzzy logic. And I expect there's fuzzy logic on a lot of stuff nowadays that we don't see. Incidentally, uh, I got my ASE medallion in the mail. Will that focus? Can you get a focus on that? Anyway, that was uh, something that I probably got about six or seven of these. This was for L1. I just re-upped on the L1 certification, the advanced engine performance. All right, in the chamber, the throttle blade controls the power output, regulates the fuel charge. And, you know, incidentally, regulating the fuel charge on a diesel is the same way. But you might notice that some diesels have throttle plates. Well, why do some diesels have throttle plates? Well, the ones that have throttle plates typically have that because they want to cause a low pressure area right behind where the air goes in so EGR will flow the right way. And so if, they, if you've got a diesel with an EGR system, several different ways of handling this, uh, but some of them have throttle plates, like the 6 liter had a throttle plate, and some of your Duramaxes had throttle plates, and that was to facilitate EGR flow. And it had an electronic throttle body, and you had no control over that. It would decide when to operate that thing. So the points ignition were replaced by electronic ignition, made a lot of people mad. Fuel delivery morphed from fuel from Venturi delivery to electronic fuel injection. You know, carburetors were complicated enough, and there was a, some of them that were so complicated it would be just best to throw one on there than trying to rebuild. I got some of those Makuni carburetors. <laughs> but uh, at the same time, people, a lot of the older mechanics understood carburetors really, really, really well. They always knew exactly what to do when one of those wasn't working right. Although when I was at the dealership, and there was a, a ton of carburetors still out there, and there were people coming in there, and every last little thing that that vehicle didn't do right, you had to piddle with that carburetor and get everything adjusted just so-so, and sometimes it was kind of difficult, especially if there was some hidden air leak somewhere that you couldn't find because it was maybe the bottom of the carburetor was warped just a little bit, and you couldn't see it or couldn't tell it. Um, There's just all kinds of issues there. And I'm telling you, <clears throat> having worked on carburetors for 20 plus years before I, you know, before most of all of them were gone, uh, carburetors were fun and enjoyable, but sometimes they could just drive you nuts. And if you got a car with a carburetor on it, sooner or later you're going to have to tinker with that carburetor and straighten it out. But I've owned several vehicles with electronic fuel injection and have not had to do a dead gum thing at all to any of those except occasionally I might replace an oxygen sensor if I think it's getting a little sluggish or something like that. Um, but as far as running problems or any of that kind of thing, fuel injection has always been a whole lot more dependable than carburetor. Just like electronic ignition, 
I uh, gave you a hotter spark and better starting. This friend of mine has got a 71 Cadillac Eldorado that he uh, likes to tinker with. And uh, it had points in the distributor. And I told him, I said, why don't you get one of these electronic ignition kits from the parts store and put on there? And he did it himself. He put it on there. And he says, man, this thing starts and runs better than it ever did with points. He said, I can't believe I hadn't already done this. It was a handy thing right there. All right. Now, the throttle plate now, though, has morphed into electronic throttle control. We'll talk a little bit about that. Now, some of your, you might notice on some of the, like of the uh, F-Series pickup trucks that had the fuel injection, and they would have this little linkage on the top of the, uh, you know, on the throttle shaft, so that the throttle cable was not directly moving the throttle shaft, it was operating this little bit of this linkage, which had a little, a little rod with a couple of throttle ball joints on it. And whenever you would give it the gas, if you just hooked the linkage directly to the throttle plate, the way that one was set up, it would open the throttle too fast. But you know, another it would start out opening it slower, and then it would open it too fast, and it would cause it, <laughs> you know, do crazy things. So they had to put that linkage on there to even out the speed that the throttle plate was opening. There was some heavy duty engineering that went into that. But on the other hand, some of them were like this one and just they had this basic, you know, thing here. Now this pretty much does the same job, so if it had a cable and uh, instead of the linkage and all, and it, it would open the throttle plate. So the engine controller has got to make decisions on the fly uh, about all kinds of stuff. Uh, the driver's choices are some of them. Uh, the inputs from engine coolant, mass airflow, and all are related to the choices the engine controller makes. Then there's this fine-tuning thing it's constantly having to do on the fuel trim based on oxygen sensor input. So there's, it's fairly complicated, but we're not going to cover that fuel trim stuff today. When the vehicle first started, idle air control on the ones that have it, you know, the ones before the electronic throttle control, and the idle air control is open wide and the injector is double pulsed to wet the manifold. That's kind of like what the accelerator pump did on your old carburetor. You had to tap the gas and it would set the choke and it would squirt some gas in the manifold. Um, you know, and, and that, what, the way I always checked a carburetor, if I had a carbureted vehicle with a no start, I'd hold the choke open and move the throttle and see if I saw gas squirting in there. If you didn't, there wasn't any gas in the carburetor and you already figured out something you needed to do first. Well, the engine still needs always what it needed. It needs extra fuel and air at cold start. That's just the way it is. Now, this right here, this kind of, uh, this is a stepper motor thing, and it basically walks. You know, one of these will be hot, and it walks the ground through the other ones, or one of them will be ground, and it walks hot through there. And it's turning a little screw that's moving this out and in. So there's threads on this, but it can't turn, and it turns the shaft, I mean, the uh, sleeve around that pintle, and it goes in and out. And there's actually, when you look at your scan tool, you, you can tell by the number of steps how far this thing has opened the idle air control. And it knows how far it has opened it. And it doesn't move it very fast. Uh, but that's kind of what that looks like. And they're not all wired the same way. They may look alike, but they're not all wired the same way. A Jeep doesn't work like a GM. And, you know, some of the Chryslers work different too. But anyway, that was... Uh, but you basically, for no touch starting... You want this idle air control to open wide open when you first start it, and then it goes back in and it regulates the idle speed higher when it's cold, and then it evens back down to probably, you know, 650, 700, whenever it's warmed up a little bit. It's kind of funny to me. <laughs> One time this uh, mechanic that worked over there close to me that was, you know, kind of, he was a pretty good mechanic, but he was kind of learning about some of the uh, forward fuel injection stuff, and he came over there, his name was Mark. Uh, I knew a bunch of marks. So this isn't the same marks I've, mark I've talked about before. Uh, but this guy came over there and he says, I'm having trouble getting this Ranger to idle right. And I says, well, what you probably need to do is you need to clean this out. You need to make sure you're, you know, unplug the idle air control. And uh, with a thing sitting there running hot, you need to dial that uh, idle stop screw into where it's idling about 550. And then plug the idle air control back in. Blah, blah, blah. I gave him a whole bunch of steps to do it here you know, wrote all that down, and he went and did it. And he come back, and he says, uh, wow, that worked like a champ. You must have done this before. And I says, nope, never have. <laughs> and he grabbed me by the throat. <laughs> it was funny to me. He was a funny guy anyway. At Keown, the engine controller gathers data on barometric pressure, coolant, air temperature, 
and closed throttle position sensor voltage, which it, it considers that the CT closed throttle. So it's got to gather that information every time and store that for the entire key cycle. Now, if any of these inputs don't line up with reality, you're going to notice things going wrong. The throttle position sensor here has got a. Most people know how these potentiometers work. This moves with a throttle plate. This is a resistive strip. And the closer you move it toward ground, the lower the voltage is. The farther you move it toward the reference voltage, the higher the voltage goes, up to about 4.6. It doesn't ever go completely to 5 volts. If you ever read, if you look, like if you back probe the, um, the output signal wire, and you're seeing 5 volts there, and you got 5 volts here, you're going to have lost the ground that you have through signal return here. Uh, you can demonstrate that if you're piddling around with something by un, you know, unlatching your signal return wire, disconnecting it in some kind of way, and you're going to get a full 5 volts if, volts if you don't have that signal return. And that's something I used to teach people. I have seen vehicles that the signal return ground had been lost inside the engine controller and all the sensors were reading maximum voltage and all I really had to do, and probably that wasn't the right way to do it, but I just ground that wire, uh, that signal return wire, because it went to all the sensors and that would bring them all back online and the car would start and everything would be fine. The idle speed will initially be higher at first start than it is with a warm engine, just the same as a carburetor. If the AC is on or the steering wheel is turned, the idle speed will increase to meet the load demand. Now, they used to have on General Motors cars and on some of the Ford Escorts, they had this uh, spring loaded vacuum diaphragm they called an idle load compensator. And when engine vacuum started to drop off, it would extend to raise the out, uh, the, you know, the open the throttle a little bit. And it would just automatically feather and find the right spot to hold the thing where it was supposed to. Uh, you can look up idle load compensator, particularly on GM, I think that's what they call theirs. Um, but the, the diaphragm that they had was a lot smaller than the one. And the, see the screw, uh, the only, remember, might remember the old uh, GM idle speed control motors, the, well, the little motor and the switch in it and all. Um, it had a particular looking screw that you'd have to have a special wrench to turn to adjust the, you know, and that same kind of screw was on those GM idle load compensators. This is early 80s stuff, so don't dig too deep into that. Uh, when the throttle begins to open, the PCM monitors the amount and speed of throttle opening and adds extra injector pulses, which basically duplicates what the fuel, uh, what the accelerator pump and the carburetor used to do. So you're going to get, if you're ever looking with a scope that's got high enough resolution, and you look at your fuel injectors, when you open the throttle, if you're used to, usually the crankshaft sensor gives the injectors their cadence, click, 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 it's going to be, and as you pick up engine speed, they click, 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 click faster. Well, when you give it the gas, if you're uh, reading a high enough resolution, you're going to see extra injector events in between those regular clicks, uh, which is where it gives that. Now, I was talking one time about a van that my buddy was working on, and it was uh, running really, really rich when you first started it, and he was trying to figure that out. I had a fuel injected, you know, 5 ohm in it or something like that. And so he, uh, we looked at the, he didn't know he had data stream. I found, I told him, yeah, you got data stream, look at here. We went to the data stream part of the scan tool and the you know, throttle position sensor, even when you weren't applying the throttle, was moving all over the place. And it was adding extra fuel, I mean, fuel injector squirts thinking you were operating the throttle when you weren't. And the only thing it could look at on that old system was that throttle position sensor. And if it's drifting around, you know, you, that was why it was running rich, because of the injector, extra injector squirts. All right. This was first used for traction control, early electronic uh, throttle control systems. Like these are early 90s <coughs> and late 80s, you know, Lincoln Mark 8, Lexus, SC300. <coughs> this throttle body I took, <coughs> well, excuse me, um, the customer had replaced this throttle body on an SC300 because it was running rich. And I kept the throttle body because it's got this throttle plate that looks like a choke. And what it was basically there for was to close off the air going into the engine if you're spinning the wheel. It was part of the traction control system. And uh, of course there's other ways they can detorque the engine whenever, you know, as a part of traction control. They can do it electronically. But this this throttle, throttle plate was totally driven. You had no control over it. 
Um, and this bottom one down here, we still operated by a cable and it had a TP sensor on it and all that kind of thing. Um, and they, it had idle speed control and so on and so forth. But <clears throat> that was the uh, that was an electronic throttle plate that they had. Now, think about this for a minute. With the electronic throttle control, you don't need an idle air control motor or idle speed control motor. You don't need any hardware for cruise control. When I bought my 2007 F-150, it was only two years old, it had 68,000 miles on it. It looked like a brand new truck, still does, because I ain't hard on my vehicles and I'm really careful to take care of them and drive them gently. Um, all I had to do on that one, when I went to the Ford place, and you know, used to, you could say, hey, you get a cruise control kit from the parts store. I mean, not the parts store, but the uh, uh, parts department. And I told the guys, and I was already teaching at the college then, I said, is there a cruise control kit? Listed? Because I, want, I wanted cruise control on my pickup. I said, is there a cruise control kit listed for this 2007 F-150? And they said, no, we don't have anything like that. And so I bought the $52, $52 set of cruise control buttons, pulled the airbag off the steering wheel, put these buttons on there. The wiring was already there. All I had to do was plug those buttons in went back to the back where my buddy Jimmy was working, the guy that I graduated in 07 that had been working there pretty much ever since. And I said, I just put cruise control buttons on here and my engine controller needs to know that I have cruise. He goes, okay, no problem. He plugged in the uh, IDS and he went and uh, there was a place on the IDS when he was working his way through there where it asked if the vehicle had cruise. And he said, yes. And then he did a little reflash and I wound up with cruise control. <laughs> <laughs> the light on the dash and everything. I mean, all the stuff is there, and all it needs to do is know that you're going to use cruise because that algorithm is already in the engine controller, and it can turn on the cruise light when you set the cruise. You would not, you wouldn't be able to tell just driving my truck or looking at it that it didn't have factory cruise, and that's the way I like to add an accessory. I want it to look like it came on there and was put on there at the factory, and in this case, it did. But it's because the vehicle's got electronic throttle body on it that I was able to do that. Now throttle by wire, uh, you get input from these redundant sensors on the accelerator pedal. Now on your old Power Stroke diesels, the first ones, like in 94 up to about 2003, uh, the 7.3, uh, they had a potentiometer and an idle tracking switch, or an idle validation switch they called it. And if, either, if those two didn't agree, it would only idle and you'd have to replace the accelerator pedal. Um, but this one right here doesn't have what you'd call an idle validation switch. It's got multiple potentiometers in it. And that tells the PCM what you're doing with your foot. And they got those spring loaded so that it feels like the old accelerator did. And your output to the throttle body opens the throttle plate. And then you got feedback from the TP sensor that's on the, excuse me, that's on the throttle body so that the engine controller can tell, you know, what it's actually doing with the throttle. I want the throttle to open. How much have I opened it? Just like setting the thermostat or anything else or turning the volume up and down on your radio. Your ears are the feedback. You know when it's where you want it to be. So, now this right here, these voltages are on a Duramax diesel. And it's got three pots. And look at the screwball voltages here. This goes from 0.75 volts to 4.29, which would be 750 millivolts. This goes from, I mean, and this is going from uh, closed throttle up to wide open throttle. This one here goes 4.29 to 2.98. Would you have done this this way? I don't know why they do it, but they do. And this one here starts at 3.98 and goes to 3.20. Now this is a super high resolution reading here. And this is a higher resolution reading than that. This is the one you would expect if you only had one, but they didn't want to trust that because if it was lying, it would open the throttle and you would be running away. So sending pedal movement and position information, they're not the same voltage. Some, as a matter of fact, most of them only have two sensors on the pedal, but I just wanted to show you this one along with the voltage ranges on that Duramax. I wrote an article about the uh, Duramax for Motor Age Magazine several, you know, back in the early 2000s. Sensor systems vary in their patterns, though. They don't all look the same. The waveform here shows a throttle moving from idle to wide open throttle and back to idle. These two signals, are there's, it's got two potentiometers. This is one of them, and this is the other one. And it knows exactly how those are supposed to agree with one another. 
it calculates an average of the two signals and allows the pedal position to be calculated with greater accuracy too. Plus, if one of them fails, you know, you wind up going into one of the modes I'm going to talk about at the end. Alright, this is a 2005 Altima. The TPS signal on the throttle body is a redundant signal. So, this is your TPS and this is your accelerator pedal position sensor. you got two sensors here and two sensors here. And see, this wide open throttle here goes way up here. This wide open throttle here goes here. And look, at, look how these are mirrored. See that? Your TP sensor. It goes down and look. And you can look. It's really interesting how that looks. You can uh, pull that up on your scope or if you've got a historic histogram trace on your scan tool, you can probably find that too. Now, they needed to have really speedy processing in order for electronic throttle body work to reliably open it. As soon as you hit the gas, it needed to be able to process that signal really quick. Well, if you remember, back in the late 90s, General Motors pickup trucks had a the cruise control box over there right to the between the master cylinder and the driver's side fender on the bulkhead. I don't call that the firewall because it's not there to stop a fire. It's basically a bulkhead. Uh, but whenever General Motors started in about 2000 started using electronic throttle control, their engine controller wasn't fast enough to handle it, so they had to put this little module that the engine controller could talk to, and this could process the information a lot faster than the engine controller. Now later the engine controller got faster, they got faster processors and all. Ford chose to wait until they had a suitable processor before they did it. But this throttle actuator control module is wired up like you see right here if you want to pause that and have a look at it. Now the new PCM for Ford, they had the same problem but they got this black oak processor. That's what's on my uh, Explorer. It was adopted to handle the higher necessary speed. That's Ford DTC came later than GM's. Ford didn't come out with it for a few, two or three years after General Motors started using it on their pickup trucks. And so the powertrain control module handles it all. And there's your, your electronic you know, motor. Then your TP sensor, this is both mounted on the throttle body right here. And let's see, there's your, I don't see, I guess a this schematic left off the accelerator pedal position sensor. Um, I didn't do a good job of selecting a schematic. I should have. I usually will take two or three schematics and, you know, m meld them together to create one uh, so that you can see every component of it. Anyway, and when a concern is, pre concern is present with the throttle controls, you know, the electronic throttle body, the instrument panel on the forge, you get a wrench. Um, and sometimes, you know, if it sees a problem, it'll limit the throttle opening to about halfway or something like that. Uh, but you can switch it off and restart it, and it'll, you know, try to start over, and you'll have full throttle until the wrench light comes on again. <laughs> now, it'll either eliminate a wrench light or a light that looks like this. See, so that's got, you know, they put, started putting on some vehicles dedicated gaps to tell you, uh, ded I'm sorry, dedicated lights to tell you you left your gas cap off and that kind of thing. So. You know, there's, there's more to that than the check engine lights. You know, they got a light telling you specifically. Now, how does that thing work? Well, you hold the plate open at one position. They pulse it at a thousand times a second. Um, so one, one hertz is one pulse per second. A thousand hertz is a thousand times per second. Or a kilohertz, a million times a second, is a megahertz. Well, it's fast current pulse. It retains the magnetic field because it, you know, it, rather than failing between the pulses, uh, it lets the electric motor hold the throttle plate steady wherever it decides to hold it. And the duty cycle has everything to do with how far. And so just, that's for, for what that's worth. But I'm going to tell you something really important right now. And I've said this repeatedly. Um, whenever you are fooling with electronic throttle bodies, keep your finger out of it. Don't put your finger in the throttle body. Uh, particularly if it's on the vehicle. Now let me hit you with a scenario. Let's say that you told somebody you switch on the key but the engine's not running. You tell somebody hold the accelerator pedal all the way down. Okay, so they hold it all the way down, throttle plate opens all the way up. What you don't realize is that throttle plate has a spring for safety, but it does not. The spring is not what closes the throttle plate. These electric pulses close the throttle plate. In other words, the throttle plate's electronically closed, driven closed by that motor. 
if you've got your finger in there with a rag wiping out that throttle body and your buddy happens to have his foot slip off the gas pedal, that throttle plate will cut your finger off or try to. Uh, so make sure if you've got something in the throttle body, have him open the throttle body electronically. By, don't open it with your finger because in some cases you can destroy the throttle body so you have to replace it. So keep your fingers out of an electronic throttle body. Uh, err on the side of caution always. Somebody holds the gas pedal down, use a toothbrush or something. It doesn't matter if the, if the guy's foot slips off and it pops the end off your toothbrush. You can get that out of there. But do not put your finger or any other part of your anatomy in a throttle body and expect it not to be cut off if somebody releases the throttle. And even if the key is not switched on, you say, yeah, I can open this with my finger because it's just spring-loaded. That ain't a good plan either because I got a buddy that did that, and I didn't know this till he told me. Don't remember what kind of vehicle it was, and you might get away with it on you know several different vehicles. And he did it on one and wound up having to replace the throttle body on it at his expense because he's the one that messed it up. And he was honest enough with the customer to say, look, I caused this problem over here. I'm going to have to buy you a throttle body. You got normal mode, which is selected at power up, and will remain active till the problem detected. Now, once the problem detected, the appropriate action will be taken. Limit performance mode. Uh, it's activated when the driver intent cannot accurately be determined or when the output of the engine power is impaired. Like if the engine doesn't have as much power as it ought to have, then it, it picks up on that. So maximum power is lowered, throttle control is slowed, and the warning lamp is activated. You got forced idle mode, which is activated when no driver intent is available. It doesn't know what you're doing, so it won't let the thing go above an idle. The accelerator pedal position sensor connector not being connected or complete failure, you know, no, or no faulty AP. In other words, if it doesn't know what you're doing with the throttle, it's not going to assume and try to, you know, drive the vehicle. Um, the engine will start and run, but it will just sit there and idle. Power management mode is activated when the, it cannot, I, put, I meant to put ETC and I put ECT, duh, get used to typing those three letters. Can't reliably control the power using the throttle. It's disabled so it can return to the default position. And it's controlled by using fuel and spark only, and that's used by an inability, usually an inability to, inability to position the throttle plate, uh, or you get lost the TPS input from the throttle body. The engine shutdown mode, if the ETC system is unable to reliably process the control algorithms, say they don't want this thing taken off with you and causing you to crash and burn. That's their whole thing, you know. All right. I hope you guys enjoyed this. And have a great week. And hey, let me know what you think about this. And let's be careful out there.